Um, it's wonderful to be here, and um, uh, it's an honor, and I'm, I want to thank Wyatt and everyone for, for having me here again. Um, it, it is always a strange feeling to be up here speaking in an official capacity. I, I first started coming to Suwannee um, as a kid to the music camp, so um, I always feel I should be practicing or I'm missing orchestra. <laughs> this is a much better feeling. <laughs> um, um, and it's, it's great to be uh, teaching this year with Charles Martin, um, a, a poet and translator I admire very much, and I was thrilled to hear a poem about the Sabine women, because I also have a Sabine women poem, um, which is not, you know, that's one of those myths that there are lots of paintings about, but not so many poems, you know, like Lot and his daughters. Um, <laughs> but, you know, so um, these women have been snatched away from their families because the men who are going to become Romans need wives. Um, and later there's a war over them, or there's going to be between their fathers on the one hand, their fathers and brothers, and their husbands on the other hand. But by this time, they've had children, and they have mixed feelings about that. And they say, stop. O oh, ravishers, O oh, husbands, you have won. We are the country that is tamed by children. Light-footed maidens now waddle behind bellies in which two histories quicken the future. Tomorrow will dawn with a pang like breaking waters. Oh, you have yoked us, yes, but you have yoked us to yourselves. Now see, you too are bounded on all sides, not by enemies, but in-laws. <laughs> a sigh has turned the heart into a hearth. Let marriage be a truce, for from now on, the war between us is a civil war. Jigsaw puzzle. First the four corners, then the flat edges. Assemble the lost borders, walk the dizzy ledges, hoard one color, try to make it all connected, the water and the deep sky and the sky reflected. Absences align and lock shapes into place, and random forms combine to make a tree a face. Slowly you restore the fractured world and start to recreate an afternoon before it fell apart. Here is summer, here is blue, here two lovers kissing, and here the nothingness shows through where one piece is missing. And when I first came to this conference as a scholar, um, Rebel's Rest was, uh, was where the, the French house activities happened, um, but also faculty was staying there, so it's rather shocking to, to see it, it burned, and um, I'm sure it will be um, rebuilt even better than ever. Um, but I am going to read this poem. Burned. <laughs> you cannot unburn what is burned. Although you scrape the ruined toast, you can't go back. It's time you learned the butter cannot be unchurned. You can't unmail the morning post. You cannot unburn what is burned. The lovers in your youth you spurned. The bridges charred you needed. Most you can't go back. It's time you learned smoke's reputation is well earned, not just an acrid, empty boast. You cannot unburn what is burned. You longed for home, but while you yearned, the black ships smoldered on the coast. You can't go back. It's time you learned that even if you had returned, you'd only be a kind of ghost. You can't go back. It's time you learned that what is burned is burned is burned. The, the first time I, I did a reading here, um, uh, my son Jason was in the audience. It was an afternoon reading. And through the, the course of the reading, he started slumping over his chair and eventually ended up sprawled out in a, a state of just abject boredom. <laughs> <laughs> sprawled out over here. I think there were photographs. Um, and uh, he, he is not here tonight. He's watching a movie. <laughs> but that means I get to read a poem about him. 
listening to Peter and the Wolf with Jason, then aged three. He's, he's fixing to be ten. Eyes wide open, grinning ear to ear, balanced between the thrill of fear and fear. He clutches at my skirt to keep me near and will not let me leave him by himself in the living room where Peter and the wolf emerges from the speakers on the shelf. He likes Peter's jaunty swing of strings, the reedy waddle of the duck, the wings that flute up in the tree, but still he clings even though for now it's just the cat picking its sneaky way through sharp and flat. He isn't frightened of a clarinet and laughs at grandfather's bluster and bassoon, but keeps his ear out for another tune at the shadowy edge of the wood and coming soon. Where is the wolf? He asks me every chance he gets. And I explain each circumstance, though it's not as if he's heard it only once. You'd think he'd know by now. Deep in the wood or under the tree or sent away for good to the zoo, I say, and think he's understood. And weary of the question and the classic, I ask him where the wolf is. With grave logic, he answers me, the wolf is in the music. And so it is. Just then, out of the gloom, the cymbal menaces, the French horns loom, and the music is loose, the music's in the room. Of course, it is only fair that I must now read one for my daughter. <laughs> so um, my daughter's name is Atalanta, um, and uh, and I, I grew up in Atlanta. And um, you know, I thought this is a good Greek name. We live in Greece. Um, there's a nice story attached to her. Um, I didn't really think so much about the Atlanta Atlanta thing, but I, anyway, I told my mother that we had named our daughter Atalanta, and there was a a polite pause, <laughs> and then she said. But what are you going to call her? <laughs> For Atalanta, your name is long and difficult, I know. So many people whom we didn't ask have told us so <laughs> and taken us to task. You too, perhaps, will wonder as you grow and blame us with the venom of 13 for ruining your life. Using our own love against us keen as a double-bladed knife, already I can picture the whole scene. How will we answer you? Yes, you are in a hurry to arrive, as if it were a race to be alive. We weighed the syllables and they rang true. And we were hoping, too, you'd come to like the stories of princesses who weren't set on shelves like China figurines. Not allegories, but girls whose glories included rescuing themselves, slaying their own monsters, running free but not running away. It might be rough, singled out for singularity. Tough. <laughs> Beauty will be of some help, you'll see, but it is not enough to be nimble, brave, or fleet. O oh, apple of my eye, the world will drop many gilded baubles at your feet to break your stride. Don't look down. Don't stoop to scoop them up. Don't stop. So also, as a, as a mother, um, a lot of things that you used to think, you know, were charming or whimsical or delightful, you grow to hate. Such as balloons. <laughs> so this is the mother's loathing of balloons. I hate you. How the children plead at first sight, I want, I need, I hate, how nearly always I at first say no and then comply. Soon, soon they will grow bored clutching your umbilical cord. Over the moon lighter than air, should you come home they'd cease to care. Who tugs you through the front door on a leash won't want you anymore and will forget you on the ceiling. Admittedly a giddy feeling, later to find you puckered, small, crouching low against the wall. Oh, thin of skin and fit to burst, you break for her who wants you worst. 
Your forebear was the sack of the winds, the boon that gives and then rescinds, containing nothing but the force that blows everyone off course. Once possessed, your one chore done, you float like happiness to the sun, untethered afternoon, unkind, marooning all you've left behind, their tinfoil tears, their plastic cries, their wheedling and moot goodbyes. You shrug them off, you do not heed, oh, loose bloom with no root, no seed. So um, my husband and I live in Greece. We have lived there since January of 1999. We live in Athens. I, I do sometimes have to explain when I'm in Atlanta, you know, I say, we've flown in from Athens. And they say, there's a flight? <laughs> <laughs> and, and pretty much the first question, or the second question maybe, after, you know, we live in Athens, either in Greece or in America, is are you there permanently? What does that mean? None of us is here. <laughs> um, so this is a this is a villanelle. They are they are way more fun to write than to read. I hope this is not the case. <laughs> After a Greek proverb, "Uden moni motoron tu prosorinu." Anyway, you'll you'll find out what that means. We're here for the time being, I answer to the query. Just for a couple of years, we said a dozen years back, nothing is more permanent than the temporary. We dine sitting on folding chairs. They were cheap but cheery. We've taped the broken window pane, TV still out of whack. We're here for the time being, I answer to the query. When we crossed the water, we only brought what we could carry. But there are always boxes that you never do unpack. Nothing is more permanent than the temporary. Sometimes when I'm feeling weepy, you propose a theory. Nostalgia and tear gas have the same acrid smack. We're here for the time being, I answer to the query. We stash bones in the closet when we don't have time to bury. Stuff receipts and envelopes file papers in a stack. Nothing is more permanent than the temporary. Twelve years now and we're still eating off the ordinary. We left our wedding china behind, afraid that it might crack. We're here for the time being, we answer to the query, but nothing is more permanent than the temporary. So I, I do have some characters that appear um, in different books over the years. I'm, Greek mythology is, is a big thing that comes back. Um, also, um, Alice in Wonderland. My name is Alicia, and my mother's name is Alice, and, um, and I live in a strange place. <laughs> so that just, it just keeps going. Um, but it's one of these things, you know, one reads Alice in Wonderland um, over and over again, but Through the Looking Glass is a, is a very different, um, more grown-up and stranger book, and, and you forget some of the strange details, you know, you're, if you're playing through a chess game. And one of the strange squares is the square where um, uh, Things have no names. So, Alice bewildered. Deep in the wood where things escape their names, her childish arm draped round the fawn's soft neck. Her diffidence, its skittishness in check merged in the anonymity that tames. She knits her brow, but nothing now reclaims the syllables that meant herself. Oh well, she need not answer to the grown-up beck and call, the rote learned lessons, scolds and blames of girlhood, sentences to pars and gloss. She's untwinned from the likeness in the glass. Yet in the dark ellipsis, she can tell she's certain that her name begins with L. Lucy, Lizzie, alias, alas, alas, alike, alone and at a loss. Of course, one of the nice things, Greece is very beautiful and I like to swim in the sea. Um, I always swim with uh, shoes, like little swimming shoes, because if anyone in the family is going to end up with a sea urchin in their foot, it will be me. So I've written them a poem. <laughs> sea urchins. 
Um, and we were talking a little bit about uh, syllabics in class today. So for those of us who are counting, um, these are in kind of haiku-shaped stanzas, 575. Five. The sea urchins star the seafloor like sunken mines from a rust-smirched war filmed in black and white. Or if they are stars, they are negatives of light. Their blind beams, brittle purple needles with no eyes. Not even spittle and a squint will thread the sea's indigo ribbons. We float overhead like angels or whales with our soft underbellies just beyond their pails, their dirks and rankles. Nothing is bare as bare feet, naked as ankles. They whisker their risks in the fine print of footnotes, irksome asterisks. Their extraneous complaints are lodged with dark dots, subcutaneous ellipses. Caesars seldom extract even with olive oil tweezers. Sun bleached, they unclench their sharps. Doom scalps their hackles, unbuttons their stench. Their shells are embossed and beautiful calculus. Studded turbans tossed among drummed pebbles and plastic flotsam. So smooth, so fragile. Bobbles like mermaid doubloons, these ro rose mauve pistachio tinted macaroons. Um, so this, I am um, in theory working on a translation of Hesiod's works and days. Um, it has taken me a really long time, so I clearly need to be paying more attention to the works. Um, <laughs> But, you know, I do feel I'm a little bit in this conversation with, uh, with Hesiod. Um, I can sort of hear him saying, what are you doing? You're wasting your time. Get back to work. Um, and, of course, he is the first poet uh, that uh, describes the story of Pandora. A jar. The washing machine door broke. We hand washed for a week. Left in the tub to soak, the angers began to reek, and sometimes when we spoke, you said we shouldn't speak. <laughs> Pandora was a bride. The gods gave her a jar, but said, don't look inside. You know how stories are. The can of worms denied. It's never been so far. Whatever the gods forbid, it's sure someone will do. And so Pandora did and made the worst come true. She peeked under the lid and out all trouble flew. Sickness, war, and pain, nerves frayed like fretted rope, every mortal bane with which mankind must cope. The only thing to remain lodged in the mouth was hope. Or so the tale asserts. And who am I to deny it? Yes, out like black-winged birds the woes flew and ran riot. But I say that the woes were words, and the only thing left was quiet. I was, um, you know, rereading Christopher Smart's delightful Jubilate Agno and the wonderful thing about his cat, Jeffrey. And um, two of the lines in that suddenly struck me as so completely bizarre <laughs> that I just had to start a new poem with them. Um, Psalm beginning with two lines of Smart's Jubilate Agno. So the first two lines are, are Christopher Smart. For the Lord commanded Moses concerning the cats at the departure of the children of Israel from Egypt, for every family had one cat at least in the bag. <laughs> <laughs> for that is the origin of the phrase to let the cat out of the bag. For cats do not like to travel from their homes in cages, nor Sherpa bags, nor will they submit to the collar or the leash. For all days to the cat are the Sabbath, the day of rest and freedom from the yoke. <laughs> For the children of Israel had learned from the Egyptians the excellence of cats and their fastidious maintenance. For lo, even in Herodotus, it is written of the Egyptians that they mourned their cats who had died. For the Egyptians shaved off their eyebrows to remember a perished feline. For the bereaved Egyptians must have seemed often quizzical with no eyebrows. 
For when their dogs die, the Egyptians shaved their whole bodies as well as their heads, altogether a less subtle look. <laughs> Four, a missing eyebrow would be raised at death like a question mark on its side. For I do not know if the Egyptians then drew eyebrows on over their shaved off ones, as some ladies do, unfortunately, to this day. <laughs> Four, the Egyptians mummified their dead cats that they might prowl the afterlife, stalking mice forever. For the mice were in the afterlife too, even without getting mummified, crawling through some wormhole in the wainscoting to get to the golden grain left for the pharaohs. For the cats had their own cat goddess and were already monotheistic. For cats do not believe in the dog-headed god of death, if you consider a jackal a dog, which I do. <laughs> For the cats had little need of an afterlife in truth, what with their nine regular ones. For when they were mummified, it was in strips of papyrus, Egyptian newspaper. For on this were sometimes the scraps of poems, the news that stays news. For cats know how to scan and make no false quantities. For cats are poetry, whereas dogs are prose. <laughs> For Moses could issue no commandments to the cats themselves, for cats only contemplate suggestions. For a cat, for a dog moves his tail to say yes, but the cat moves her tail to say no. <laughs> for the cats told Moses to divide the Red Sea, for they had a repugnance of getting their paws damp. <laughs> for the dry sands of Egypt proved an excellent litter box and, prever and preserver of papyrus. For in some theories, cats carry the parasites of insanity. For the mummies of cats are wrapped in ancient laundry lists and the lost fragments of Sappho. For a shaved eyebrow is the lacuna of grief. Weathering. It is, it's wonderful here to be in the rainstorms. You know, we don't get so many of those in Athens. It's very atmospheric. So this was a rare rainstorm in Athens where I remembered what it sounded like. Weathering. The rain is haunted. I had forgotten. My children are two hours abed, and yet I rise, hearing behind the typing of the rain, its abacus and digits, a voice calling me again, softer, clearer, the kids lie buried under duvets, sound asleep. It isn't them I hear, it's something formless that fidgets beyond the, the window's benighted mirror where a negative develops, where reflection holds up a glass of spirits. White noise precipitates. Rain is a kind of recollection much has been shed, hissing indignantly into the ground. It is the listening belates, haunted by these finger taps and sighs, behind the beaded curtain glistening, as though by choices that we didn't make and never wanted, as though by the dead and misbegotten. I'm sort of obsessed with similes. And I hate Sestinas, so I've combined these two interests. <laughs> um, and it be, I think people, they, they think the problem with writing a Sestina, besides, you know, having that idea in the first place, is that, you know, is that there are these six repeated words and they come back in this mathematical pattern and so forth, the repetends. Um, but uh, in fact, uh, human beings are incredibly repetitive and narrative is repetitive. It's not a problem of, of six words repeating. It's a problem that the poem is 39 lines long. And um, not every idea conduces to that, it turns out. Sestina-like, um, with, <laughs> with a nod to Jonah Winter. Many of you may know his wonderful Sestina Bob. If not, look it up. Now we're all friends. There is no love but like. A semi-demi-goddess, something like a reality TV star look-alike, named Simile or Me Too. So we like in order to be liked. It isn't like there's love or hate now. 
Even plain dislike is frowned on. There's no button for it. Like is something you can quantify. Each like you gather is almost something money-like token of virtual support. Please like this page to stamp out hunger. And you'd like to end hunger and climate change alike, but it's unlikely like does diddly. Like just twiddles its unopposing thumbs up, likewise props up, scarecrow silences. I'm like so over him, I overhear, but like he doesn't get it. Like, you know, he's like, it's all okay. <laughs> Like, I don't even like him anymore, whatever. I'm all like, take like out of our chat. We'd all alike flounder, agape, gesticulating like a foreign film sans subtitles. Fall like dumb phones to mooted desuetude, unlike with other crutches. Um, when we use like, we're not just buying time on credit. Like displaces other words. Crowds cuckoo like endangered hatchlings from the nest. Click like if you're against extinction. Like is like invasive zebra mussels, or it's like those nutria things, or kudzu, or belike redundant fast food franchises, each like more like the next. Those poets who dislike inversions, archaisms, who just like plain English as she spoke, why isn't like they're literally every other word? <laughs> I'd like us just to admit that's what real speech is like. But as you like, my friend, yes, we're alike how we pronounce, say, lichen, and dislike cancer and war. So like this page. Click like. <laughs> uh, and I, I am really obsessed with similes. Um, so this is, uh, I, I adore epic sim similes particularly because they're you know, maybe in the midst of war, something dire is happening, and, and suddenly there's this simile that opens this window onto another possibly pastoral world, um, and they're, they're fun to play with. So this is, I call this from Book Omega of the Odyssey. The suitor's skittish shades began to squeak like the scritch of a toxic fumed permanent marker scratching off the names of those who are absent, or as when deep in a cave a small brown bat plummets to the guano-speckled basement jagged with assorted speleothems, and the colony of bats is all a twitter, a roost that's been afflicted with the fungus that causes the contagious white nose syndrome which strikes during hibernation, rousing the bats from torpor early, stirring them to starve, and they gibber like dementia from the cave's mouth into the starless cold night of extinction, taking with them a white night-blooming flower dependent on chiropterophily. Just so, the suitors pipistrelled and bleeped trailing the lord of florists with his wand and Nike sandals, he who delivers a species like a bouquet of spiky asphodel, appalled with pollen to the halls of hell. So this is a, kind of a similar one. This one just riffs off two little lines from the Iliad. Colony Collapse Disorder. Just as a swarm pours from a hollow rock in one long beeline for the wild time alighting in clusters on this purple and that, but is stricken with a mass amnesia that disorients the compass of the sun, and they forget the steps to traditional dances, and each helicopters into a different dimness, taking their saddlebags of sweetness with them, and the hive goes dark, the queen is left to starve, and the drones humbug the whimper of the world, and the palace falls to ruins, broken into by vandals who would loot the golden stores left in the brittle wax hexameters, just so. The stain. The stain remembers your embarrassment, wine or blood, sweat or oil, when the ink leaked your intent because you thought no truth could soil, or when you let the secret slip, or when you dropped the leaden hint, or when between the cup and lip the Beaujolais pled innocent, or when the rumor's fleet was launched, or when the sheets waged their surrender, but the breach could not be staunched and no apology would tender, 
When overserved, you misconstrued and blurbed your heartsick on your sleeve. When everything became imbued with sadness, yet you couldn't grieve. Inalienable as DNA, self-evident as fingerprints, it will not out, although you spray and pre-soak in the sink and rinse. What they suspect, the stain will know. The stain records what you forget. If you wear it, it will show. If you wash it, it will set. <laughs> um, so, I was, uh, four or five years ago, I was commissioned to be part of a project. Um, uh, Atava Rima is coming upon several important birthdays. I think, um, I think it's the, shortly going to be the 500th anniversary of Ariosto and um, I want to say 150th of Don Juan. Um, is that right? No, that can't be right. 200? I can't count when I'm up here. Um, <laughs> um, and I was commit there's, there's going to be this new Don Juan, and um, poets were commissioned to write new cantos, which were east, obviously supposed to be an Atavarima and at least 50 stanzas long. And I was about to have a baby, and I said, no, I cannot do it. No, I will not have time to do it. No. Um, and they said, but it will be due in 2014. And I said, no, maybe, I don't know. And, um, <laughs> and then like, I could not do it and I could not do it. And I said, I told you I couldn't do it. And then they were about to um, like, go into proofs or something and they said, you know, give it a try. And um, so I, I tried. So I'm, I'll give a little bit of this. Um, so they've, I, part of it was they said, okay, so this new Don Juan, it's gonna be, it's gonna be Donald Johnson and he's a 60 something year old British guy. And I, I just, it, I had trouble sort of imagining, you know, how I was going to do this. Um, and I really wanted to sort of bid for, I think it's Canto 3, where the Isles of Greece is, you know, Isles of Greece, Isles of Greece, where burning Sappho loved and sung, mountains look on marathon, all that. Um, because I live in Athens, and, you know, I felt like I had at least something to say about Greece. Um, and then it turned out that one of the other poets, an Irish poet whom I will not mention, decided she would set her thing in modern-day Athens about austerity. I said, no. And then I said, really, I can't do it, but this is my turn. <laughs> Back in Athens now, 2013, less drama on the streets and more despair. Bureaucrats get fat when times are lean. Police are thick in Constitution Square. Protests continue wearied in routine. Street vendors still turn out to sell their fare. Donnie looks from his room in the Grand Britannia. You still can't beat the view from up here, can you? You gotta go with the Byron. <laughs> There's Parliament, the guards, everyone mocks for skirts and pom-pom shoes. And since it's sunny beyond the stadium and apartment blocks, there's Mount Hymettus, famous for its honey in ancient times and clouds and fleecy flocks. It all conspires to turn your mind from money. Even the protesters, since unemployed, decide the day is one to be enjoyed and furl their banners, pack up megaphones and head for Plaka, some outdoor cafe to get their nicotine or caffeine jones. Without the tear gas, somehow it's blasé. The Plaka cats link by all skin and bones on Byron Street, where gypsy urchins play, or rather Roma children, Zorba the Greek on old accordions that wheeze and squeak. Some tourists snap their picture, girl and boy, but don't drop them a coin. Isn't it sweet, some local color? Thus the hoi polloi of Westerners meander down the street in flip-flop seeking t-shirts or a toy or plastic reproductions. We have to eat, the kids tell Don in Greek, and then they point. He buys them cheese pies at a sandwich joint and feeling pleased to have got off so cheap with charity, so fine and short and sterling, so different from when Don began to peep as last night's hangover began uncurling. It's always easier to sow than reap. He thinks he'll have a drink, but then a purling vibration from his trousers starts to presage his blackberries turned on. An urgent message? A friend from schools in Athens to deliver a talk of the residents. Lord, what a bore. Expats and diplomats and many a silver-haired matron well-preserved. He knows the score and how the wine won't flow. It makes him shiver. It's like a nightmare he has had before. But then the postscript, did I mention Alice will be there? His friend always was a phallus. <laughs> He's just the type who'd smilingly correct your grammar, Greek or English. How it vexes and now have to hear the bloody lecture. The problem with Don's history with sex is the past is never past. It's still conjecture. It seems that every spot is marked with X's. 
He'll stop and have a glass or two of Rocky and Seven Sharp. He'll be in Kolonaki. The evening is in honor of Kavafi, some anniversary, sesquicentennial of birth or death. Well, soon he should be off, he thinks, or he'll be late. He'll shower, then he'll put on a fresh shirt, down a quick Greek coffee. The faint anxiety he feels perennial, it suddenly occurs to him that's why he's seen lines of Kavafi flashing by on trams and buses, his one day of leisure between dull meetings. They all seem to say, I'll hand my body over to sensual pleasure, or I'm not in the mood to work today. Poetry being the only national treasure the politicians could not give away. And not a day goes by the parliamentarians do not misquote expecting the barbarians. Ray Dalvin's version is clear, if not sublime. And now we find him at the ambassador's house, just late enough in Greece to be on time, no worse for wear after an infamous grouse, and only a few gray hairs beyond his prime. He greets the young ambassador and his spouse, two elegant young men. Well, wouldn't you know it, a nice surprise, especially for the poet. And during the long lecture, strong and dry, he thinks of a Bombay Saf Martini, a phantom from his past, catches his eye, his heart too. Now he's back in Santorini, it's 1980, and a girl walks by in a laconic take on the bikini. The black volcanic sand, the pristine water, it's Alice to the life. Nope, it's her daughter. Anyway, it goes on. Um, but of course, I'll, I'll let you guess what happens. But um, there is a, I had to of course do the Isles of Greece. So he's listening, this is a, a, a rap version, although it doesn't really rap. But. <laughs> the trials of Greece, the trials of Greece, where tragic callous thrilled the nation and shrill Mercury would not cease to ask for the repatriation of Elgin's, their translation garbles, let's just say Greece has lost her marbles. <laughs> Muses of Ritsos and Kavafi, Seferis, Palamas, Elitis, have they all gone for Turkish coffee or Nescafe? How bittersweet is poetry and song, but lo, who shut down public radio? The mountains look on Marathon, and Marathon looks on the bay. Olympic venues ten years on, and nothing's gained and all to pay. Security still has its demons, despite those hefty bribes to Siemens. Persia now is called Iran, and Xerxes has long gone to dust. Cyprus nicks the Annan plan, and no one takes her banks on trust. Austerity is blind or deaf, and freedom is the IMF. In Constitution Square, conveners deliver megaphonic sermons in the traditional 15ers or blast Philippics on the Germans. Occupation come full circle. It's all so murky. Call it Merkel. <laughs> <laughs> You know the joke, it's rather droll. Miss Merkel visits this fair nation, and when guards at passport control say name, Frau Merkel, occupation, she laughs a little. Here's the sting and says, Nein, I'm just visiting. <laughs> a, <laughs> a, day, a, day, a day late and a euro short, the IMF admits mistakes. Although it's too late to abort, no bureaucrat exaggerates. Austerity youths in capotes will tell you is in Greek litotes. But blame the politicians, too, who were too busy getting rich Byzantine teams of green and blue to notice the old bait and switch. No longer can they flaunt their lots, the dry docks chock-a-block with yachts. Though hardly any go to jail, each party quick to grant asylum, so then it's when it's their turn to fail and their own newspapers revile them, they wriggle out of the kerfluffle, the decks are stacked, the parties shuffle. Give me some ouzo or retsina with no receipt or VAT. When Xerxes sat on Salamina and watched his tub sink in the sea, he didn't know to thank his luck. Who runs this country runs amok. The unemployment rate is rising while pensions sink and prices spike. What is the use of moralizing? Let's have a drink and go on strike. A poet strike, that's what we need. <laughs> They'll beg us for the latest screed. <laughs> Even graffiti has to rhyme, even the anarchists must scan. The fascists chant in perfect time, and so do the lefties, to a man or woman. Slogans, cries, and curses, what's a protest, sans the verses. Yes, thanks, I'll have some ouzo yet, a liquid pure and clear as lethe, until some water gets it wet and it goes cloudy underneath. The problem churns and gets no better, the ouzo just keeps getting wetter. On Byron Street, the t-shirts sell with slogans from Thermopylae. 300 Spartans went to hell, that Greeks, helots aside, be free. There's money, if the mint will take it, let's tell the Troika, come and take it. 
The Isles of Greece, the Isles of Greece, the Greeks will sell them one by one and hope to buy a little peace by auctioning the sea and sun. No war has been their fate, but tax and greed and debt and Goldman Sachs. Europe, thy very name is Greek. You were a princess once and fair, wide-eyed perhaps, a little weak, but everyone has flaws to bear. The trip was promised wonderful, but the ride you were taken on was bull. Thank <laughs> you.